Hi, I'm Shu, and I welcome you to my talk about paradoxes of probabilistic programming. A probabilistic programming language is a domain-specific language for machine learning and statistical inference. It looks like a normal programming language extended with three constructs. First, rand for random sampling, second, observe for conditioning, and third, run for running your simulation. Let's look at an example. Suppose a scientist randomly selects a man and a woman and measures their heights. We assume the woman's height, h, is normally distributed with mean 1.7 and the man's height, h prime, is normally distributed with mean 1.8. And our question is what's the expectation of h conditioned on h prime being equal to h? We can do that as a probabilistic program as follows. First we define a simulation function here called meters and in the first line we sample the height h. Then in the second line we observe that h is equal to another sample from the normal distribution centered at 1.8. In the third line we return h to indicate that that's the variable we are interested in. Then we run our simulation a thousand times and we compute the average. In this case as you might expect we get 1.75. We could also have done this simulation in centimeters instead of meters by multiplying all values by 100 and as usual that doesn't change the result. Unfortunately this good behavior doesn't always happen. There are programs in which changing from meters to centimeters does affect the result. Here's an example. Suppose the scientist is lazy and only does the measurement half the time. Then we get this program. In the first line we sample h as usual, but then we do the observe only 50% of the time by wrapping it in a conditional with a flip statement. The flip statement samples a random boolean which is true with probability 0.5. This program produces an answer of 1.72. If we convert it to centimeters by multiplying all values that had meters as units to by 100, then we get the following program, which outputs 170 instead of 172. So the answer depends on whether the scientist uses meters or centimeters. This is strange. We get these outputs if we run this with an important sampling in Anglican. But the problem is not limited to Anglican because we get this behavior even in formal operational semantics, such as the commutative or quasi borel semantics. And it's unclear what the answer of such program should be, or whether these programs should be disallowed. You may object that you shouldn't do observe a variable number of times based on a coin flip. Well, here's another example. Suppose the scientist is drunk and measures the weight instead of the height half the time. Then we get the following program. In the first two lines, we sample the height and the weight, and then, depending on a coin flip, we observe something about the height or something about the weight. This happens to give 1.75 again. If we go to centimeters, by multiplying all values that had units meters by 100, we get 170. In this case, we have the same number of observes regard regardless of the coin flip, and even with the same distribution, although with different parameters but the output still depends on whether we use meters or centimeters. You may object that you shouldn't do observe inside the conditional at all. Well, suppose the scientist uses a ruler marked in log scale. Here's the original program, and here's the translated program. Instead of the normal distribution, we use the log normal distribution. Sampling from a log normal distribution is the same as sampling from a normal distribution and then exponentiating it. So in effect, we are here conditioning on x of h being equal to x of x of h prime. You may think that it shouldn't matter whether we use a linear scale or log scale, just like it shouldn't matter whether we use meters or centimeters, but in this case the programs do give different answers. We have no conditionals in the, inside the program, but we still have this strange behavior. The output depends on which scale we use. This raises the question what probabilistic programs actually mean, and what does probabilistic conditioning even mean? These problems are related to the borel komogorov paradox, well known in probability theory. Here's an overview of the paper. We first identified the problem that probabilistic programs are not invariant under parameter transformations. And furthermore, it's not clear what observe really means. The key ideas of the paper is to figure out what observe should do by analogy with the discrete case, in which there are no paradoxes, even when we have conditionals. Then we change the language so that observe conditions on intervals instead of on points. Third, we 
add symbolic in infinitesimal so that we can choose the interval width to be infinitesimally small to allow us to condition on measure zero events again. The result of this is a new language which is invariant under arbitrary parameter transformations, even nonlinear ones. And programs have a clear probabilistic meaning via rejection sampling. All of this has been implemented as a DSL in Julia. Let's take a step back and look at probabilistic programming in the discrete case. Suppose you roll three dice, x, y, and z, which take integer values between 1 and 6, and suppose you observe that x plus y equals z. We could ask, what's the probability distribution of x now? This distribution definitely changed because x cannot have value 6, for example. If we didn't have a probabilistic programming language, we could implement rejection sampling ourselves. That works as follows. We start with an empty samples array, and then for a thousand runs, we sample three values x, y, and z, uniformly between 1 and 6. And then if the condition holds, we append x to the array, because x is the value that we are interested in. Here you see the histogram that results. As we increase the number of samples, the answer becomes more and more accurate. As you can see, indeed, 6 is not possible. This is the key idea of probabilistic programming. We can answer probabilistic inference questions by repeated simulation and filtering. And a probabilistic programming language is simply a DSL for such simulations. Here's what that looks like. We start with a normal programming language and we add random sampling from a distribution D. Then we add an observed function, which takes a Boolean B and filters on this Boolean being true. Third, we add a run function, which takes a simulation function func and a parameter K that determines how many trials we will run. Here's the previous example using this DSL. First, we sample three values X, Y, and Z. Then we observe that Z is equal to X plus Y. And finally, we return x to indicate that that's the value we're interested in. Once we have defined this simulation function, we, we run it with the run function for a thousand times, which gives us a samples array. Here's the entire implementation of the DSL. We have a global variable weight, which is initially 1. We have an observed function, which takes a Boolean b and sets the weight to 0 if the Boolean is false. Then we have the run function, which takes the simulation function func, and a parameter k, and it starts with an empty samples array, it runs a loop for k iterations, and in each iteration it sets the weight back to 1, runs the simulation function, checks if the weight is still 1 after running it, and if so, appends the result to the samples array. This gives the same result as previously. You can view this as a simple refactoring of the previous program. We can have multiple observe statements in the same program, and as in this example, we can even run observe a variable number of times. Here the for loop runs a variable number of times based on the outcome of the dice throw of x. This is fine because now we have a clear semantics based on rejection sampling for all these programs. On the right you see the result. Only 5 out of the 1000 samples got through. This is a problem because if most samples get rejected then convergence is slow. The standard solution to this is to use important sampling instead of rejection sampling. To do that, we must change observe of random d being equal to x to pass in d and x directly into the observe function. Then, inside the observe function, we multiply the weight by the probability that a sample from d is equal to x instead of setting the weight to 0 or 1, depending on the random outcome. Weights are now numbers between 0 and 1 instead of only 0 and 1 and run returns an array of weighted samples. Here's what that looks like. On the right you see the histogram which displays the array of weighted samples. Now all the samples got through but their weights got adjusted based on the observes. When d is a continuous distribution this idea doesn't work because then the probability that a sample from d is exactly equal to x is always zero. So when we do, try to do it anyway, then rejection sampling will reject 100% of the trials and important sampling will set the weight of all trials to zero. The standard solution to this is to use the probability density function PDF of d of x instead. So instead of uh, multiplying the weight by the probability, we multiply it by the PDF.
The intuition of this is that the PDF is proportional to the probability that a sample from D is close to X. Formally speaking, the CDF of D and X is the probability that a sample is less than X, and the PDF is the derivative of that. Well, this was the end of probabilistic programming 101, and now we will look at why this results in paradoxical behavior. And it turns out that using the PDF instead of the probability is the source of all, all the strange behavior. Let's look at what goes wrong when we have conditionally executed observes. Keep in mind that observe now multiplies the weight by the PDF instead of the probability. As it turns out, the PDF is not unitless. For example, for the normal distribution we have a factor of 1 over sigma in front of the unitless exponential, but sigma has units, so this whole value has units. This means that the weight has units inverse meters in some trials and inverse kilograms in other trials. And that results in unit errors when computing the weighted average at the end. So the sum adds values of 1 over meters to 1 over kilograms, and it's no surprise that if we do that, then we get strange behavior. It may seem that conditionals are to blame, but recall that the log scale example didn't have any conditionals, but it did have paradoxical behavior. It turns out that conditioning on events of measure 0 is ambiguous. To condition on an event of measure 0 in probability theory, one thing you can do is to define a set of measure non-zero, in this case a of epsilon, which says that x is at most epsilon away from y, and b of epsilon, which says that x of x is at most epsilon away from x of y, and then condition on those instead. Conditioning on sets of measure non-zero is no problem, and then you can take the limit of epsilon going to zero to, to condition on events of measure zero. James, James says the following. Although the sequences a of epsilon and b of epsilon tend to the same limit x equal y, the conditional densities p conditioned on a of epsilon and p conditioned on b of epsilon tend to different limits. As we see from this, merely to specify x equal y without any qualifications is ambiguous. Whenever we have a probability density on one space and we wish to generate from it one on a subspace of measure zero, the only safe procedure is to pass to an explicitly defined limit by a process like a epsilon and b epsilon. In general, the final result will and must depend on which limiting operation was specified. This is extremely counterintuitive at first hearing, yet it becomes obvious when the reason for it is understood. So let's listen to Jane's and let's only condition on events of strictly positive measure. To do that, we change the observed construct to take an interval as second parameter. Here you see an interval centered at x with width w. The meaning of this is that we condition on a random sample from d lying in that interval. To implement that with rejection sampling, we do the sample and we check if indeed that lies in the interval, and if not, we set the weight to zero. We can also do important sampling simply by multiplying the weight by the probability that a sample from d lies in the interval. For intervals, this probability is non-zero, so this actually works, unlike the previous case. Let's take a look at the lazy scientist example, but now with intervals. On the top we have the centimeters and on the bottom the meters. In both cases, the observe is con executed conditional on a random coin flip. And now the second argument of observe is an interval, which has a width. On the top this width is in centimeters and on the bottom this width is in meters. As you can see, we have to adjust this width if we change units from centimeters to meters or vice versa. This is what will ensure that the programs have the same output and no unit errors even though the observed is conditionally executed. We have no unit errors because now the weight variable stays unitless because it only gets multiplied by probabilities which have no units. Furthermore, rejection sampling and importance sampling always converge to the same answer. Alright, that's nice, but suppose we still want to condition on measure zero events. Jane said that that's okay as long as we do it as a limit of strictly positive events. So the idea is now to parameterize the program by the width of the interval that we want to use. And take the limit of that variable going to zero. Here's what that looks like. We parameterize the simulation function by the width, and we use that variable as the width of the intervals everywhere. We can't use it directly because then the units don't make sense. In one case we need a value of units meters, and in the other case we need a value of units kilograms. So we are forced to introduce extra constants a and b with the appropriate units. And as it turns out, the relative size of these constants matters even as the width goes to zero. 
Here on the right you see an example. The blue line is the output of the program and on the x-axis we have the width of the interval. As you can see, as we decrease the width to zero going to the right, the value first stays about constant, but then it converges to somewhere around 19 as the width goes to zero. The question is now, can we compute that limit directly without using any approximations? So one thing we could do is to actually choose the width to be 0 0.1 and then 0 0.01 and so on, and make it converge to zero to approximate this value, but we would like to compute this limit directly and exactly. We do this using infinitesimal numbers, which we define as a pair of a real number r and an, and an integer n, and we write that as r times epsilon to the n. The intuition here is that epsilon is a small number, so then epsilon squared will be even smaller and epsilon cubed will be even smaller. We can do arith arithmetic on these kinds of numbers as follows. To add or subtract two infinitesimal numbers, we add or subtract the coefficients if the exponents are the same, but if one exponent is larger than the other, then one will be infinitesimally smaller than the other, so we can ignore either the left-hand side or the right-hand side. To multiply these numbers, we multiply the coefficient and we add the exponents. To divide, we divide the coefficients and we subtract the exponents, and this is well defined whenever the coefficient of the de denominator is non-zero. And in all other cases, this is well defined. To use this for probabilistic programming, we need one more ingredient. We need to be able to calculate the probability that a sample from D lies in an interval when the interval width is finite and when the interval width is infinitesimal. To do that, we distinguish those two cases. If n is zero, then we have a normal number and we use the CDF to calculate this probability. But if n is greater than zero, then we have an infinitesimally small number. And now the PDF comes back into the picture. If the exponent is greater than zero, then the result is the PDF multiplied by the original number. This is very nice because now we can use this probability function as an interface to the distribution D, and we no longer need to care about the difference between CDF and PDF. We have a uniform interface for measure zero intervals and non-zero measure intervals. If this all makes sense, we have the following correctness properties. First, we have consistency with existing probabilistic programming languages. If we do an observe on with epsilon, then that gives the same result as doing an observe in the existing probabilistic programming languages, provided the observe happens outside conditionals. If the observe happens inside conditionals, then we may compute a different result, but I would argue that's a good thing. Second, we have consistency between non-zero width intervals and infinitesimal width intervals. If we do an observe on an interval with epsilon, that gives the same result as doing observe on a finite width interval and then taking the limit of the width going to zero. This is ensured by the following theorem about infinitesimal arithmetic. Suppose that we have a function f of x, which in, is in a certain restricted form, which I will define later. And suppose that when we plug epsilon into this function f, then we get r times epsilon to the n. If that happens, then we know something about the behavior of f around zero. So a probability expression is simply an expression using arithmetic plus minus times and division and the probability function that we defined previously. This is enough because important sampling is of this form. It does compute a probability expression. You can prove this theorem by induction on the form of the expression. And for that, we need this n in as a, an exponent. But in the end, we are interested in the case n is 0. When we put n is 0 into this theorem, we simply get that the limit of x going to 0 of f of x is r. Here's what that theorem actually means. On the left, we have three example probabilistic programs, and on the right are their outputs. The blue line is the output of the program as a function of the interval width w. As you can see, as we, can, as we go to the right, this interval width may change, but at the end of the day, when the width becomes zero, it converges to a certain value. The orange line is what you get when you put an infinitesimal number into these functions. As you can see, the orange line is already at the converged point, so now we can actually compute 
the limit correctly without doing any approximations. So this is an experimental verification of the previous. Another advantage of infinitesimal widths are that they allow us to do parameter transformations correctly. Usually when we apply a function f to an interval, we just apply it to both endpoints. But if the width is infinitesimal, then the midpoint x gets mapped to f of x, and the width gets multiplied by the derivative. Here's the log example again. Here's the original code. And on the right is the code that you get if you apply the parameter transformation correctly. Now, the width epsilon gets mapped to h times epsilon, and this h comes from this derivative f prime. If you do it this way, then indeed both programs give the same output, which shows that the parameter transformation has been correctly applied. We can even add language support for parameter transformations. To do that, for a function f on the reals, we define two operations. First, we define what it means to apply f to a distribution. So in that case, f will return a new distribution, which is a transform distribution. And we define that by defining random sampling PDF, CDF of this distribution. In particular, random sampling from f of d is the same as sampling from d and then applying f. Second, we define what it means to apply f to an interval. For finite width intervals, we define that by applying f to the endpoints. And for infinitesimal width intervals, we define it as on the previous slides. In order for this to make sense, we have to ask that f is monotone and differentiable. This allows us to do the parameter transformation even more simply. Here's the original program, and here's the logarithmic program. We simply apply the exp function to both arguments of observe. In general, we have the following property. Whenever we do observe on f of d and f of i, that's the same as doing observe on d and i. And this property ensures that in general, programs are invariant on our parameter transformations. Let's recap. First, we saw that certain probabilistic programs have paradoxical behavior. We saw that programs that we expect to be equivalent give different outputs, such as programs using meters or centimeters, or programs in normal scale and log scale. The root of the problem was that conditioning on measure zero events is ambiguous. So what we did is instead to condition on intervals which have non-zero measure. And this restores rejection sampling as a ground truth semantics, but we can still use important sampling as an efficient semantics. After that, we modeled measure zero events as an explicit limit and computed that using infinitesimal arithmetic. The good property of that is that an observe on an infinitesimal width interval agrees with observe in existing probabilistic programming languages in most cases, specifically when it happens outside of conditionals. But now, with these intervals, programs are invariant under arbitrary parameter transformations, so all paradoxes are ruled out. We have briefly looked at how infinitesimal arithmetic is implemented, and in the paper you will find a full implementation of the language in Julia. If you found this interesting, I would love to see you at the question session. In particular, I would like to hear from you what you think about the implications of this for future probabilistic programming languages and formal semantics. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to send me an email. Thanks for listening.